Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this Oxford Sparks live Q&A event, which is actually the last one in our Science at Home series of videos. So thank you so much if you've joined us for some of those. And if you're new here, then welcome. I hope you enjoy today's event. And if you go to our YouTube channel, which is Oxford Sparks, you can catch up on all of the other videos that have been in the series. So you don't need to worry, you won't have missed out. Also, you could subscribe to our YouTube channel if you fancy it and keep up to date with everything going on at Oxford Sparks. And we're also very active on social media, so you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Oxford Sparks and keep up to date with everything going on science wise at the University of Oxford. If you already follow us on Twitter, you might have noticed that we've had a special day today with who I'm going to be introducing shortly taking over our Twitter feed and they've been talking all about their research um, into how meat, how bad is meat really for us and uh, all of the, their research which we're going to be finding out about over the next half an hour or so. Uh, so just before I introduce them, a reminder that we are live so if you do have questions don't hesitate about putting them in the chat box. There are no stupid questions and we love to make this into more of an interactive conversation. So please do that. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Annika Knupel and Dr. Karen Papier, who are from the Cancer Epidemiology Unit here in Oxford within the Nuffield Department of Population Health, uh, which is in, within the Medical Sciences Division. So, good afternoon, both of you. Hi. Hi. It's brilliant for you to join us, especially on this very hot afternoon, certainly in this part of the UK. So, um, yes, we will keep you for the next half an hour or so before we all enjoy a nice cold drink. Um, so it would be great if we can just hear a little bit about what you both do, the specifics of your research. So um, I don't know, Annika, do you want to go first and just tell us in a couple of minutes what you're working on? Yeah, so my name is Annika Knubber. I'm an epidemiologist, which is probably a term you've heard a lot now during COVID. So we look into um, disease and health in the population. Uh, I have a background in nutritional sciences, so I studied nutritional sciences in Germany, then did a PhD in public health and epidemiology at UCL and been working at Oxford now since 2018. And I work on the broad topic of um, animal sourced foods, which is basically meat, dairy and other animal sourced foods and health. And me and Karen, we're both part of the LEAP project, which is short for Livestock, Environment and People. And the whole project is not just our work, but um, also looking into the environmental implications of meat and animal source foods, but also looking into how people could change their diets and the kind of social political implications of thinking about diet sustainability and health. Brilliant. Thank you. And Karen? I'm Karen Papier. I'm a nutritional epidemiologist uh, with Annika, also with the LEAP project. As a nutritional epidemiologist, I'm interested, of course, in how the food we eat and also our lifestyles affect our disease and our health. Um, all over the world, we have different disease rates and we also have different behaviours. So it's really interesting to see how these different behaviours can affect our disease risk. My background is in public health nutrition, global health and epidemiology. So before coming to the University of Oxford, I was working in Thailand and in the Philippines and Australia and really looking at how their different diets and the changes in behaviors and lifestyle affected different disease risks. Uh, here in Oxford, as part of the LEAP project, I'm looking particularly at meat and how either eating meat or not eating meat and the lifestyle factors that go with it affect the disease risks. So Annika focuses more on cancers, so how meat relates to different cancer risks. And I look more at non-cancerous chronic diseases. So things like diabetes and heart disease, uh, digestive diseases. And we do that together and try to answer questions in uh, people living in the UK. Brilliant, that's uh, really, really interesting to hear what you're both up to. And I'm very pleased that we've already had a question in, so that's fantastic. Just before I get to that one, um, I think a good place to start would be how bad is meat for you? You put a poll on Twitter earlier asking this question and what people thought and you didn't just offer yes and no, you also said it's complicated. Um, I think this might not be completely straightforward um, but yeah maybe that's a good place to start and then we will get on to uh, 
Uh, also, Paris, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, question in a moment. Yeah, I think I'll take that question. Um, yeah, so so we do have um, kind of some idea what mate could be associated with. So one of the most well-known things is colorectal cancer. And that's, um, I think Karen would agree, that's the one thing we're quite confident saying that that's probably true. But with a lot of um, the question around meat and health, we have a general problems that um, with the diet that we look at, first of all, we need to we kind of need to ask people about their diet, and that has loads of kind of difficulties. People might not say what they eat, and it's actually really hard. If I ask you how often do you eat strawberries in a year, you might know in March and April because you eat them a lot then. But how much would it be across a year? Um, so we have the issue that it's really hard to collect. Um, but then also with question around meat. We compare people between like high and low meat intake, for example. But sometimes in many of these studies, we don't actually have that many people who, for example, completely abstain of meat. Um, so we don't really have that comparison group. So when we want to look into the comparisons between the two, we're very limited because we only have a limited number of people that we can ask. Um, so all these kind of smaller issues around data collection affect the kind of ability of us to say, oh, this is bad for you. Um, and in science, usually we would say the best way of finding out if something is really bad for you, and there's kind of a causal association, we would say, is by um, doing a trial where we either give one person, for example, in drug trials, we'd give one person the drug and the other person gets a tablet that looks the same but doesn't have anything in it. So with meat, we can't really do that. You know what you're eating. So if I would give you some, you'd know you'd be eating meat. But also if I tell you to not meat eat, you might be like, yeah, I'll do that. But you might just do it for a week. You might not want to keep on doing it for many, many years to find out whether your cancer risk changed. So we have like a lots of limitations. We make it so difficult for us to, to actually see how, we, how one thing relates to the other. So we have to rely on finding a lot of, if we find these observational associations over and over again, and they're corroborated by other areas of research, like animal research, new research, looking into kind of mechanisms, and then we're more confident with the associations we found. So yeah. to summarize kind of the current, what we currently know, it's associated with colorectal cancer, we're fairly confident with that one. Um, there might be some associations with cardiovascular disease and diabetes, um, but more research is needed. And some of that research Karen and I are doing basically right now, yeah. <laughs> Karen, did you want to add anything about you know, the health risks um, which aren't cancer, you know, to do with diabetes and things like that? Yeah, so as Annika was saying, we're currently conducting a review. So we're trying to take all the information that's available out there for ischemic heart disease, which is one of the outcomes we think has a little bit more evidence compared to some of the other outcomes. And we're pulling it together and really trying to see what does the story tell us? So what does what happens when you look at different countries, different size populations, men, women, younger populations, older populations? So we're just working on that review right now. We have some ideas as to the plausibility of why maybe there could be elevated risks. So we know that um, meat consumption, meat does have some saturated fat. So it's, it's plausible that the saturated fat could increase the risk of heart disease. Uh, likewise, um, maybe the salts added in the processed meat that could increase our blood pressure and heart disease as well. Um, and there are, of course, many other mechanisms relating to what we know about colorectal cancer um, and how these also relate to other diseases. This is an important factor because sometimes we might find something and it, it could be a chance finding. It could be something that isn't meaningful. And as Annika was saying, we need to rely on evidence coming from genetic studies, trial studies, animal studies, the types of studies we do. So the more we can really pull these things together, the better idea we have about um, meat and our health. Absolutely. Brilliant answer. And it feeds quite nicely into to what I was going to ask next, which is in the media, we see lots of conflicting messages, don't we? Scary headlines about whether meat is really bad for us. Um, and the question that actually came in was, what's your take on everything causes cancer now? You know, these very sensationalist things that we hear. Um, so, yeah, what would you say about those conflicting bits of advice and how should we know what to believe? Maybe, I don't know, 
yeah. And if I do want to start. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to repeat myself a bit, but I think, yeah, it's a very good question. It's exactly, it seems implausible. And I think that's a good thing what the person who asked the question already asked. It seems a bit implausible that everything causes cancer. Um, and we have to see that with a level of kind of, um, yeah, like kind of awareness that this seems a bit, um, yeah, overly kind of, yeah, just maybe a bit too, too dramatic. And um, some research that me and Karen are doing, we're trying to look at, so for example, my work at the moment, I'm looking at a number of different cancer sites to find out whether it's associated with everything or maybe not. Um, this research is not out yet, so I can't like kind of tell you yet what's happening, but um, it's going to be published soon. So look out for the Oxford website. I'm surely going to post about it. Um, but this is definitely um, a, a kind of important question to ask. Currently, at least from the evidence, there has been uh, yeah, some associations reported with some cancer sites, but also um, some studies have not found associations. And I think one important thing to remember is the media won't pick up on that story because it's not fun to hear, oh, there's nothing going on between meat and um, XYZ cancer. That's not the research that gets um, a headline. Um, and I think many, we know that many newspapers actually really like those, like the the meet, the headlines about something causing cancer. Um, we've been told that in media training even, like, oh yeah, this is actually a topic, people love that, um, which is horrible to think of. But yeah, oh. it's something that I think is being, yeah, it's being pushed and always remember, you don't hear all the stories. Me and, and Karen as researchers, we hear those stories. We can look into the research and we, we have colleagues that we know that don't find associations, but that's not the ones that will make it into the news. Um, and then there is one big issue around um, why we see those associations and with some type of kind of unhealthy, potentially unhealthy pattern of eating, because people who eat a lot of meat tend to also eat little whole grain and eat maybe a little less fruit and vegetables than people who eat um, a bit less meat. So we have all these other factors that play into it. And often what is the case is it's not only the meat, it could be other factors, both other diet as well as other factors, generally being more health aware, maybe also doing a bit more physical activity, being a bit more affluent. All these factors might have actually played underneath this, which looked like an association between one thing, but is actually association with something else. Yeah, it's it's really important to remember that. And I think anybody who's done science up to a certain point, there's that phrase, isn't there? Correlation is not causation. And you have to really look underneath to see exactly what's going on. So um, yeah, really interesting points. And, and thank you again for your question. Karen, did you want to add anything? Or if not, we can move on. I think Annika summarized it beautifully and I think everyone could put their little epidemiologist um, hat on and anytime you really do see something published in the media that seems a little bit, but yesterday I was told this, today I was told that, of course some of the stories we are, they're unraveling as we go, so some things we sort of find out more and more each year, but just to really sit back and ask yourself, has this been shown before? Is this something I've heard of? before? Is this plausible? Is this something that could happen? Was there something unique about this study? Was this study done maybe in people who don't smoke, don't drink alcohol, and only eat this sort of food? Or maybe in people who are 15 to 20 years old compared to people who are 80 to 90 years old? So just to really take a step back, think about who the study is about before right away believing or feeling like you necessarily have to change your habits and how you eat. I think that's such an important message, not just for this part of research as well, you know, for anything that we're reading is is being able to to have a think about the plausibility and, and putting it into context and all that kind of thing. So, um, well, maybe again, this leads on quite well to, um, I know you've said a little bit about this already, but how do you go about asking your research questions, i.e. maybe you could give us an insight into what your, a day in the life would be um, for you to maybe not Right now, it's a bit of a weird situation, but when you're you're back in the department, <laughs> I'll be happy to take you on a little tour. Um, oh. So, <laughs> uh, the way Annika and other researchers are able to answer these sort of questions about diet and lifestyle and health is really by looking at information that was collected from 
free living adults, so people outside of laboratories, people that are walking around like you and me. <laughs> and these are people that are kind enough to really volunteer their time and take part in a cohort study. So uh, you may have heard of some cohort studies. So these are things like UK Biobank or the Million Women Study, which, as the name suggests, has over a million participants in the cohort. So wow. generally what happens, yeah, it's a big number, <laughs> very impressive. So generally what happens is if someone says they're happy to take part in a study, then they'll provide information. So they might do this via receiving a, a questionnaire at home, or they might come to a recruitment center where they can fill in an online questionnaire or paper-based. They might supply their bloods. They might have their height, their weight measured. So they really fill in a, a large amount of information, and this might depend on what the study is on. So for studies that are interested in, in the questions we're interested in, participants will be asked about what do they eat? So like Annika said, how many strawberries maybe have you had in the last year? So you might have a huge list of questions about your diet. Then you might have questions about your alcohol consumption, your physical activity, smoking. Did your parents have any diseases? How many children have you had? And this not only gives us an idea of, of how you eat for what we're interested in, but also what your lifestyle is like. It really gives us a good picture of what adults and participants taking part are like. And the, the willing, nice adults taking part in these studies usually also provide us with consent to then follow up their data. So we link their data to health records. So this means that we have access to information on cancer registries, hospital admissions, death records. So not only do we say, Pretend you've taken a part in a study and it started in 2005. So in 2005, you came in, you filled in a survey, you had your bloods taken, you had your weight, your height measured, and then we may not see you again. But instead, we can just follow your health records. And now in 2020, we can see if you've developed a disease. So what that allows us to do is with these huge numbers of people to see who developed a disease over, say, these 15 years of follow-up. So when you took part in the study, you didn't know that you were going to develop the disease. And, and we hope that you don't, of course. But we can then see who developed the disease and who didn't. And the disease is the disease of interest. So Annika might look at a certain cancer. I might look at a certain cardiometabolic disease. And then we can compare how were the people different. So say we had 15,000 people develop a heart disease. What did these people do differently 15 years ago to the people who didn't develop a heart disease? Did they eat in a certain way? Did they have too much meat, not enough meat? Were they smoking a lot? Did they take a certain medication? And this then allows us to make inferences around population health and risk factors at a population level. So this doesn't mean that we're saying if your grandmother smokes 100 cigarettes every day for 100 years, she's going to get a risk of, you know, say stroke from smoking 101 cigarettes. But it's saying that we can look at patterns of disease in a population and risk factors that really affect a large number of people in a certain area. And then you can run this study with a different cohort collected in a different country where maybe, say if it's a dietary factor, maybe dairy or meat consumption is really low and we might see different disease rates. So this really helps us to infer information. So we're completely dependent on these lovely cohort studies um, with people volunteering their time. To yeah, find, to yeah. Find search. Amazing. Like how incredible to be able to use such long term data and to see those patterns. That's yeah, super interesting. Um, you gave such an excellent answer. I don't know if there's anything to add, Annika, but um, would really, it yeah. A brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, we've had another question in which isn't directly related to what we were just chatting about, but we love questions. Um, so do you happen to know how meat consumption in the UK varies over the year? Do we always eat loads around Christmas or in the summer on our barbecue? <laughs> this might not be something that you, you know about, but it's an interesting question. Yeah, I don't think, uh, Karen, I, I don't think we, we have any current, like we, we kind of know how much people eat in general in the UK. Um, but um, with men being a bit over the recommendation and women just about at it or a bit below. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, that what, yeah, what you just said about we can think of different uh, kind of things that could make us eat more meat. Um, that's probably the closest to what we can kind of extrapolate. Um, but I don't think there's, uh, I wouldn't know of any data that um, 
that I'm aware of that was looking so close closely. You'd basically have to record every month to find out if there's a yearly difference. Karen, do you um, have an idea? No, I'm with you, but I think it hits on an interesting point that people's diets do change. And for instance, in Annika and my work, we we sometimes take measurements of diet over a period of time. So someone might be asked about their diet yesterday. And if yesterday you went to a barbecue, you may have had a lot more of meat or corn or anything else you might eat at a barbecue than you had on a Thursday. So sometimes we want to take into account these various days and seasons as well, because like you're saying with holidays, you might not eat cherries this month, but you might eat cherries another month. So we're really interested in, in, in diet over a long period of time because it might take a long period of time for anything to develop or for your BMI to go up or your blood pressure to change. So, I mean, without knowing directly, it's probably likely that there's differences, which is why we try to look at usual intake by asking about the past year or by taking repeated measures to really try to, if there are any differences, try to t take account of them. I think just as an aside, it's going to be really interesting to see what's happened over the last few months with lockdown and things, because, you know, we're hearing on the news about people doing less exercise and probably their diets have changed, binge eating on the sofa. So um, I know that's not your particular area, but probably some interesting studies to come out of this. Um, uh, obviously, sad situation, but uh, yeah, be interesting to see. Um, so in your professional opinion, we were just chatting a bit about how much meat we eat. Do you have a, a particular recommendation of how much meat we should be eating? Maybe Karen? Yeah. <laughs> well, meat does for some good things. So meat is a rich source of protein and what's called a uh, complete protein, which means that it can be eaten on its own and provide all the nutrients from the protein that you need. Um, it also has B12. It has iron. It has um, it has all for good things. But we do know from the evidence and what Annika's just said about a bowel cancer that eating too much red and processed meat could increase your risk of having this cancer. And the review we're working on looking at ischemic heart disease, there could also be additional risk of heart disease with too much red and processed meat. Um, so because of this evidence and predominantly the bowel cancer evidence, a lot of dietary bodies along, around the world have recommended to, to reduce our red and processed meat consumption. And in, in the UK, Public Health England recommends that we limit red and processed meat intake to about 70 grams a day. So that could be about a sausage and a half or two thick rashers of bacon or 75 grams of, of steak that hasn't been cooked yet. So that's an idea. So around 70 grams is, is the recommendation of red and processed meat per day. Thank you for, give, for giving what the equivalents because in my <laughs> head I'm rubbish at weight. So it's like, yes, can imagine what that would be. Um, did you have anything to add to that, Annika? I uh, know, yeah, Karen said that brilliantly. Yeah, I think we, and we, from our scientific view, I think we currently agree with that recommendation as well. Perfect. And, um, you know, we, we also hear about fresh versus processed meats. Um, would you say, I mean, what are processed meats and are they worse for us than fresh meats? It sounds to me like they probably are, but <laughs> it'd be, be great to hear what you have to say on that. How That's about I talk a bit about processed meat and then maybe Annika runs you through maybe some of the health risks? That would be perfect. Yes. How does that sound? <laughs> Deal. Uh, so processed meat, by definition from the World Health Organization, is any meat that's been transformed through some sort of a process of curing or fermentation or preservation. Um, so really about processing for meat consumption. So for instance, the, the cured bacon or um, enhancing shelf life by adding some sort of um, stabilizing, something that makes the meat last longer on your shelf and even makes the flavor better. But Annika and I have found in our work that this definition is not very clear and it doesn't cover every aspect of processed meat. So we really wanted to find out what does the public understand? Because if, if we're recommending to reduce red and processed meat consumption, people need to understand what processed meat consumption is. So we did this by putting an online um, activity, a survey on processed meat, which we call Don't Go Bake In My Heart. And <laughs> you sort of sing it in your head when you hear it. <laughs> um, where we asked the public what they thought processed meat was. We gave them examples and asked them to choose, do you think this is processed? Do you think this is unprocessed? And 
We really found that there is some misunderstanding in the public around processed meat. So for instance, um, something like a hamburger, we found that context really matters. So whether a hamburger is made at home or whether it's bought from a fast food chain affects whether people think it's processed meat or not. Um, some other foods were cultural specific. So some foods we might recognize in the UK, but maybe not in other countries. So understanding around whether it's processed or not could also be affected by that. So Annika and I are now collating these results and trying to make some sort of a summary, a coherent summary of this to put something out to help the public understand so that they can, they want to reduce their processed meat consumption. They know what that means and I'll let Annika talk about why they might want to reduce their processed meat consumption and maybe why, how it can affect our health. Just before we go across, you put a, a poll on Twitter, which was about the homemade burger. So what is the answer to that? <laughs> Uh, well, I can, do you wanna, <laughs> can reveal. Well, um, that's exactly what Carol was talking about, it being a bit difficult. So we technically, it isn't processed because uh, minced meat isn't processed. Um, however, like processed from the definition around um, health and the definition given by the WHO. Um, however, this is because it's homemade. And the WHO does kind of a, a kind of factory made hamburger. They do kind of classify more as processed meat. And um, so it's kind of a very, that's why we put that in. It's kind of a tricky one because it both has the issue around the word processed, meaning technically processed for us in a general, as a general public. Um, but that kind of added WHO definition part. Karen, you agree with that, I hope, <laughs> because it is a tricky answer to give. Yeah. Um, Fantastic. Just in case anyone had been on Twitter earlier and was wondering, I thought we needed a big reveal. <laughs> yeah, let me just add, yeah, to the to the health risks. I think um so the studies that we were talking about before, Karen's describing how we do these studies, uh, and and some of the kind of biological explanations for this association do support um the association with processed meat tiny bit stronger than the association with red meat. And that's why this is um, being classified as being cancerogenic, so causing cancer and um, processed meat specifically. However, um, we have to be a bit careful about being too strong on saying, oh, it's just that meat and not the red meat. Um, we in our research do find, and if we look into other research, this sense to be still a positive association with many uh, like with colorectal cancer, with red meat as well, or at least like a borderline association. Um, and that's partly because of this issue around how we collect our data. So we we rely on people's diets. And there's actually not that many people that only eat le like red meat, but don't eat also a bit of processed meat. Um, so while we try to, as much as we can, kind of distinguish the two, we don't really have that group like red meat only meat eaters um, yeah. so it's very hard for us to do this and then at the same time we can't do as I said before the trials are very difficult to do so you can't long term expose people to processed meat and see what happens to them and um, that would be basically unethical um, yes. yeah I think just to add some of the kind of biological explanations I do going to go a tiny bit into it so what is thought to be is like some of the additives such as um, nitrates are thought to kind of build some cancerous compounds in our either in our body like kind of in our bodies when when we sorry this was a bad way to say it anyway yeah so some of the additives um could be potentially cancerous the added um uh, things that are added to processed meat um and sometimes it's also things that come from high high temperature processing um that are in processed meat um, but yeah, there is definitely more, slightly stronger evidence around processed meat, but that's why most of recommendations do include the both because we can't 100% tease them apart yet. Yeah, absolutely. Really interesting to, to think about that fact that you can't just do this study where you have nice, neat groups of A, B and C. There's, there's this overlap that's super difficult to, to tease apart. Um, we have had another question in and as always, 
the half hour has just flown by, um, so we'll have to wrap up soon. But uh, this question from Michaela, I've noticed a lot more meat replacement products in the store, plus new stories about the benefits of vegan diets. Uh, are there any indicators that this is having an effect? Um, do you know if you know more people going veggie or vegan um, lately? I, you certainly see a lot more, don't you, uh, on social media and everything. Who should we go to, Karen? <laughs> I didn't know if someone was going to jump in, but yeah. I think maybe we'll tackle it together because I feel like there's a lot of components. Annika, whatever I miss, please jump in. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's a, it's a great question and it has a lot of great components. So I'll start with the research that we know. So in terms of um, what we know about the health of vegetarians, there is some evidence that vegetarians do have low risk of some diseases. So um, diverticular disease, perhaps diabetes, um, ischemic heart disease in terms of the way they eat. So uh, in the research that Annika and I do in the UK, we work with this um, really large cohort called the Epic Oxford Study. So they're from around the UK. It's over 60,000 adults. About half of them don't eat meat at all. And the half that do don't eat very much either. Uh, and what we find is that rather than imagine you have your plate of food, rather than how we picture it, taking a steak out and putting in uh, some sort of a vegetarian source, vegetarians and vegans and, and even pescatarians, so that means people that don't eat meat but eat fish, their whole diet is different. So the whole day is different. So they have more whole grains on average, more fruits, more vegetables. So the entire day, every plate of every meal tends to look a little bit different. And what we tend to see is that vegetarians, which includes vegans, will have lower blood pressure and cholesterol. Um, and they tend to have a lower uh, body mass index as well. So obesity tends to be a little bit lower in the vegetarians and vegans. And these are things which commonly relate to health, right? So things like high blood pressure, cholesterol, and BMI tend to increase health risks. So it makes sense that if these are lower, that health risks might be lower as well. But... As Annika was saying, so this is what we know about the general sort of intakes of their nutrients. But a lot of the cohort studies that have been done, as Annika was saying, people are, they eat a few things. So they might have meat once a week. They might not be strictly vegan. It might be really hard to find someone who's strictly vegan for many years. They might be vegan for a year. They might be for six months. You know, we do see some reports of, of numbers of vegetarians and vegans, but it doesn't necessarily tell us for how long. So it's, it's possible that what they're eating is changing and we don't know what that is. So for instance, Epic Oxford, the, the cohort that we work with that does have a lot of vegetarians, diet was collected all the way from 1990s, late 1990s to 2010. And as you mentioned in the, in the question mentioned, there are a lot of new products. So it's possible that the vegetarians or vegans are actually eating a lot more of these new products and we're not able to answer this because the questionnaire we've given them that might have, you know, 100, 120 food items, it might not have things like corn or seitan or, or foods that were only sort of more recently introduced. So it's possible that we don't know what the health risks are of these foods because not many surveys or not many of the studies that have looked into this might include these foods. And another way of collecting information on food might be to ask people to write down what they've eaten which allows you to then find out about these foods, but that might be intensive. So if I asked you if you'd rather fill in a survey with 120 foods and just tick how often you eat it, or to fill in a four day diary and tell me everything you've eaten, you can imagine I'll get more participation from the ones with the shorter survey, which means that some of these foods we don't have answers for, but potentially we have newer cohorts that are trying to address this and, um, and maybe answer a bit more about some of these foods that we don't yet know about. Um, Annika, is there something else I may have missed or there's a few good components in the question? Yeah, I, I think I, yeah, I agree. I think it's, it's partly is that we can't like answer these questions yet. Um, also, I think um, I, I hear that a lot that people, oh, there's so much more vegans and vegetarians now. Um, I don't think we have like really reliable data on this. Um, but this is probably and also for the kind of age groups that we're looking at we're looking a lot at people in their middle age, like 50s 40s 50s 60s um just because of a kind of time constraint because the people the older they get they're at a high risk of disease so for us we don't have to wait that long there's a sad thing to 
to think of, but you don't have to wait that long for them to get sick potentially. So that's why a lot of our studies don't include younger people or millennials who might have changed the diets now. But I think this is something to kind of look out for in the future. Um, there's a lot of research going on in our research group at the Cancer Epidemiology Unit looking specifically into the health of vegetarian and vegans um, and try to find more data to kind of look into what, um, yeah, what, what if, if there's going to be more or also like kind of what's the health impacts of that. Um, and, and yeah, I think we have to kind of wait a bit until we have uh, good data on it and also see maybe, yeah, maybe these new food options might change people's diets. Um, and I think it's also important to think about the other aspects of beyond health. Um, and I guess the, the LEAP projects that we're working with is looking into a lot of the questions around sustainability. And I think many people, especially our age, are very aware um, of the potential health, like kind of health of the planet risks of, of a meat intake and some other animal products. Um, that might change people's diets but yeah so i think there's a very good thing to notice and i think that is definitely something we see as well in the supermarkets clearly um but yeah i think we're we're not doing that kind of research yet but i think in the leap project there's several people looking into kind of meat alternatives at the moment yeah yeah no really interesting i think you've both answered fantastically and so many things to think about there um Michaela said she didn't realise there was such a lag between these sorts of studies and present time, which is, yeah, something we might not think about, but it sounds like, uh, yeah, lots of interesting things to come up. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of people that I speak to who are vegetarian and vegan will cite ethical and environmental reasons rather than health reasons for doing that. So, yeah, it'll be great to see what the LEAP project reveals and um, everything there. So, as we were just talking about, veganism and vegetarianism, are there any particular risks associated with not eating meat? We've spoken a bit about potential risks associated with the meat alternatives, but do we need some meat in our diet, in your opinion, or are there good alternatives? So there is kind of some things that, I mean, Karen pointed it out a bit before, meat does have some good things. So meat does have protein, um, it has easily absorbable um, iron and vitamin B12. And I think that's kind of the key aspects to think of. Um, and we do see, I mean, vegans kind of should be advised to, to think about vitamin B12, especially long term. Um, you can get that from, yeah, supplements, uh, basically, if you don't want me to eat meat. So there is kind of supplementary uh, alternatives to it. Um, but that's definitely something we can see in the vegetarian and vegan studies that uh, people who eat vegan do have lower levels of that. Um, and what that could lead to is basically, but also the iron deficiency could be anemia, um, which uh, yeah. So so that's one of the one of the kind of well-known health risks coming from the fact that of the contents of meat. There has been. Uh, one of our one of our colleagues, um, you might have seen that in the news. One of our colleagues at Oxford has, for example, looked into stroke risk of vegan and vegetarians. And what they found was that a certain type of stroke, that's um, the hemorrhagic stroke, which is kind of coming from a bleed in the brain, that one was slightly increased in vegetarians and vegans. And that's really something we don't expect. Um, well, now we have to say that this stroke is kind of 15% of all strokes, so it's a very rare, rarer stroke than the common stroke that people get. Um, and yeah, we, we're still, this is obviously one study, so exactly, this needs to be shown again and again until we can fully believe it. Um, but that does suggest that there might be some things that um, the specific makeup and maybe the, the missing out on some things um, as a vegan vegetarian might um, cause some risk. Um, but I think the strongest is really, yeah, the, the vitamin B12 and especially uh, an iron. And I think especially young women have to think of, um, we know that they don't eat that much meat and they are at a higher risk uh, because of having periods. Um, so people with periods should basically look into that and kind of if they do choose to do a vegetarian or vegan diet to make sure they eat enough of other but like foods that can include it but also consider um supplements around it i don't know if karen wants to add something if i missed anything i think you answered it perfectly <laughs> and i think that's um pardon 
I was just going to say, it seemed like she answered it perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm aware we've run on a bit. Um, we have two questions that have come in. Are you happy to answer those and then we'll wrap up? Ah, thank you very much. Um, so the first one from Anna, she she asks, when you find some interesting correlation between meat consumption and some condition, is there then an opportunity to collaborate with scientists who are um, sort of in a different field to to really look into this in a more specific way? Is it quite a collaborative field? I hope that's what she's asking. Um, Annika? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, probably yes and no. I guess um, for us, uh, there is, so around that, for example, when I talked about, I guess this is coming from me saying that within the cancer research, colorectal cancer finding, bowel cancer finding, we looked at, there's a kind of looking into several um, uh, several different areas of research, and that has happened um, at the WHO International Agency of Cancer Research, and they kind of collided all this research. Um, and we do uh, definitely kind of try to a bit um, collaborate with some of the uh, environmental researchers as well in our field. Um, but I think there is still quite a divide between kind of the basic research, if you think of we find something and then we try it out in mice. Um, that's not really happening. Um, I mean, if she uh, wants to collaborate, <laughs> that sounds like an interesting thing to do. Uh, I think currently it's still quite a kind of far. We just hope that, yeah, I think we both, we get inspired by the research and we kind of try to also like, I um, mean, can we also look into kind of more uh, into certain blood markers that are somewhat related to diet to kind of try to to set up the field a bit bigger and kind of think about other areas um but there is still i think there is still kind of epidemiology does exist um yeah away from the lab what do you say karen i think from my experience that's at least what i would say i'm with you <laughs> yeah. i second that in that thank you and, and great question anna and yes open for collaboration <laughs> Um, so one last question. I, I suspect the answer might be, we don't really know yet from what a few minutes ago, but um, could additives in veggie project products potentially be carcinogenic as well? I think uh, potentially worried somebody that their good efforts might be also with some risk. Karen, do you want to say? <laughs> <laughs> we probably would say the same thing here. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. And I think also some of the processes that we talked about that the World Health Organization talks about, like enhancing flavor, enhancing shelf life, smoking of foods, doesn't matter if it's meat, doesn't matter if it's tofu. So I think there are still some really interesting questions and, and spices and different you know, are you adding salt or are you adding nitrite? So we know that nitrites might be more carcinogenic, but are some of these other additives? So I think there's definitely room for more research in this area. I think it's a, it's a great question and, and it needs to be answered. Yeah, I just yeah, absolutely. what I said before, again, think about back what the type of research me and Karen are doing, what that can do. So for example, if we wanted to investigate smoked tofu, how many people are we gonna find um, if we have a large UK population that actually eats smoked tofu potentially three times a week or more than that, and can we really use that group to investigate major diseases that come years after? Um, so that's going to be very difficult, especially if we're looking in the UK. Um, so sometimes, yeah, our research is slightly limited, especially when looking into kind of additives or even additives that aren't common. Um, so certain additives to a sweetened drink or something. Yeah, that might exist, but we can't, we don't have enough people who consume this thing often enough or have asked specifically enough. So we might have just asked about tofu. We didn't ask if it was smoked or not. Um, so there's, in our research, there's really a lack of kind of detail sometimes to find these very specific questions. So we hope that other areas of research um, yeah, as the question was before, um, they are more able to at least kind of do the starter in this for us to then add these questions and, and long term look into this this type of questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, just shows what how much there is still to learn and a really interesting field. And thank you. It was a, a great question. And um, yeah, a, a great 
place to, to finish, I guess, of looking to the future and where studies might take us. Is there anything else either of you would like to add that we might not have touched on that you particularly wanted to speak about? No pressure. We've, you know, gone over time as it is, but just wanted to give you the chance just in case. Really enjoyed the opportunity to be here with you and to, to uh, chat through some of these issues that we feel sometimes when a, a story is picked up in the media or sometimes um, people overhear things or, or talk about things, just the opportunity to really give people the tools to really think like epidemiologists and to ask these questions and to, to take a minute really before changing their lifestyles and, and understanding the more they know what we do, the more it makes sense of why maybe some questions aren't answered or some questions will take time to answer. So we're grateful to have had the opportunity to chat through this. Oh, you're very welcome. And I wasn't fishing for a, a thank <laughs> you, but that's really lovely to hear. So thanks. And um, Osho Paris says, great answers. Thank you. You're really helpful to understand our limited research possibilities and how much work it takes to, to do this kind of thing. And we've had other nice comments along the way. So um, Brilliant. Well, thank you so, so much for your time. This has been brilliant. It's also been the finale of our Science at Home series. So again, thank you so much for watching. If you've joined us just for today or for other ones, uh, we've really throughout lockdown just tried to give you a bit of an insight into the world of science, the scientists carrying out the research and yeah, to show the scientific process as well as uh, the specific research topics. So we hope you've enjoyed it. And if you've missed out on any, then they're all available to watch on our YouTube channel. Just search for Oxford Sparks. And also, as I said right at the beginning, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Again, just look for Oxford Sparks and you'll be kept up to date with everything going on. We've just had a, a brand new animation out all about how statistical epidemiologists go about modeling um, outbreaks such as the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've had a podcast all about uh, coronavirus as well. And of course, other topics not to do with the current situation. So do check those out. And uh, we're currently generating lots of exciting new content. So do stay tuned for that. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, stay safe. And thank you very much to Annika and Karen for joining us. It's been really interesting. And uh, I think Leap uh, is also on Twitter. So if you want to follow them and see uh, what they're up to, then do that as well. Okay, great. Thanks for joining us and bye for now.